Welcome everyone. My name is Mark Brackett. Uh, my day job is I'm a professor at Yale University and the director of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence and I'm going to be the moderator today. And uh, we're going to start off with introductions and a little bit of background on our panel and I'm going to start with Karen Nimi from CASEL. So Karen, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and CASEL and the field of SEL. Okay. <laughs> uh, how much time do we have, Mark? Um, <laughs> hi, everybody. Uh, nice to meet you. My name is Karen Nimi. I'm the CEO and president of CASEL. We're the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. Um, CASEL is a nonprofit, and we work from the state house to the schoolhouse across research to advance the evidence base for social emotional learning. Uh, we work at the policy level, at the federal and state uh, level, and also in practice in school districts implementing social and emotional learning and setting up models to serve as examples as well as developing tools and resources to help people do the work. Awesome. Thank you, Karen. And how about LaShawn? Oh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is LaShawn Rute Chapman. I'm the executive director of the National Equity Project. We are headquartered here in Oakland, California. Um, we are also a nonprofit um, organization who um, works to build the capacity of leaders to transform their systems um, in education um, to be places, to be resilient um, places of uh, thriving and excellence. Um, and yeah, I'll stop. Today. All right. Thanks, LaShawn. And Susan Enfield. Hi, everybody. I am Susan Enfield. I'm in my ninth year serving as the superintendent for Highline Public Schools. We are a richly diverse school system uh, located just south of Seattle. When you land at SeaTac International Airport, you are actually surrounded by Highline. Thanks, Susan. And Brad Bernatek, please. Uh, thanks, Mark. Hi. Uh, pleasure to be here. My name is Brad Bernatek. I'm a senior program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and lead the social emotional learning body of work on our national K-12 education team. Um, uh, SEL became a formal body of work for us a little over three years ago with the launch of our uh, current strategy. And during that process, we defined our goal as significantly increasing the number of black, Latino, and low-income students who earn a diploma, enroll in a post-secondary institution, and are on track in their first year to obtain a credential with labor market value. Um, it's probably helpful to know we focus on middle and high school, and so at that time, SEL was identified as sort of a promising area for investment as really an academic accelerant to support in support of post-secondary success for kids that we cared most about, particularly around healthy identity development and learning mindsets, such as with mindset, sense of purpose, and sense of belonging. In the context of equity, we think it's important to recognize that identity development and positive learning mindsets are fostered through supportive learning environments and strong relationships between students and adults. Um, so I'll turn it back over to you, Mark. Thanks, Brad. So the title of our panel of our conference is Social and Emotional Learning Pathway to Equity and Excellence in Education. So Karen, I'm gonna go back to you. And can you just define for our audience, you know, exactly, you know, how CASEL defines social and emotional learning and how it is um, linked to equity? Sure. So, you know, formally speaking, social and emotional learning is thought of as the process through which all children and adults acquire and apply the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes to develop healthy identities, to manage emotions, to achieve positive goals, to feel and show empathy for others, and to establish and maintain supportive relationships and make uh, responsible and caring decisions. With respect to equity, we believe that social and emotional learning advances educational equity and ex excellence through its focus on authentic school and family community partnerships and with an emphasis on learning environments that help to create the conditions in which kids can thrive, where adults understand their role and um, the integration of social and emotional learning into academic content. Well, cool, thank you. And LaShawn, I wonder if for our audience, if you could unpack equity. When you think about, um, when people talk about equity, oftentimes they talk about race, they talk about um, equal access, they talk about many different things. So could you help us just understand from your organization's perspective, equity? Sure. 
Yeah, um, when uh, at the National Equity Project, we think about equity in two ways. We think about equity as an outcome or a, a, dem a demonstration, right? The state that would be achieved if how one fared was no longer um, predictable by any social or cultural factor, right? Kind of equity as an outcome or a noun. But the second way that we think about equity is that to make progress on, on such a state, right? Um, it requires um, you, it requires a process um, that, or it is a process that requires um, intentional leadership. And so for us, equity is an outcome, but in order to actually make progress on, on equity, how you do your work, right, the process by which you actually try and um, close disparities or increase performance or transform experiences, how you do that matters. And so we believe that leadership is required there, that people have to see and engage and act differently in order to actually really manifest equity um, in their in the systems. Um, and so in this case, we understand the core function of education to be the whole healthy development of humans, right? Um, thinking about educational um, equity. So if it's if it is really about the healthy human development and well-being, right? Um, which of course social and emotional development is fundamental to the development of other academic skills um, and or intellectual curiosity, if that's the what then the degree to which SEL um, can actually be a mechanism to achieve equity depends on how it is actually designed, administered, developed um, in those places. Thank you. It's a great segue over to Susan. So Susan, you run a district with about, is it 30 schools? Uh, 30 schools? 18,000 kids, yeah. Yeah. And so I know, your, I know your school district very well. I've worked with you for years, um, and I know that you've done tremendous work in social emotional learning and also, you know, in equity in this intersection of the two. Can you just give us a little bit about, like, what does it look like, you know, at yeah. the school level? So, as I said earlier, we're a richly diverse school system serving about 18,000 students, and the DNA of our system is really our Highline promise. And that promise is to know every student by name, strength, and need, so they graduate prepared for the future they choose. And if you really think about that and unpack that, that statement in and of itself is a very clear stake in the ground when it comes to, I believe, social emotional learning and equity combined. Because if we could truly say that every child in our public schools was known by name, a name pronounced correctly and with love and respect, um, strength, what are they good at? How are we building resilience? I gotta tell you, my kids don't need more grit. They got plenty. What I need to do and what we need to do is help them harness that as one of their strengths so that they carry it with them to, to accomplish whatever they want to. And by need, what is it that our students need in order to be successful from, and whether that's academic, emotional, psychological, physical, whatever that is, we need to know so that they are on a path of their own choosing and not as sadly used to be too often the case, and I would argue sometimes still is in public ed, an adult predetermining a child's future for them based on their own biases or belief systems. So that is fundamentally our commitment and that guides everything we do in Highline. But I would argue that the, um, the only way that, that you can really live um, equity and social emotional learning and practice in your system is um, by making sure that it's both integrated and modeled. So by integrated, I mean, you know, we're really good in public ed of, of siloing things. So social emotional learning is in this box and academics is in this box and then you know, disciplines in this box rather than looking at how all of those things come together and that the one thing that they have in common is relationships. School discipline, fundamentally about relationships. Students' academic success, fundamentally about relationships. I mean, the list goes on and on. And so how do we, you know, sort of use relationship maybe as the, the, um, the base, but how are we integrating those things and helping people, and I think this is our, our challenge as leaders, helping people make those connections so that we aren't weakening um, the power of social emotional learning by having it set, you know, sort of stand alone as a set aside, and I'll end with this. Um, I also think it's important that as leaders we model. And so Highline, we've identified our three signature self practices for the classroom and for adults. 
and we model these um, in my cabinet meetings, in our department meetings, in our class meetings. Um, and, and that, the way that I think that you, you make this come to life and really live it and not just talk it, um, is by making sure that you are demonstrating it every day and that you're not just giving it lip service. And that's what we're really trying to do. So there's no like kit you can buy to just do the equity thing? <laughs> We're developing that now. We'll let you know when it's on the market. Yeah, there you go. Um, hey, Brad, you know, I'm curious if you can just share about, like, the, you know, you work at the biggest foundation in the world, I think. Um, can, you go, can you go, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about why SEL, why now, why equity, why now for the foundation? Sure, absolutely. So um, as I sort of touched on earlier, you know, you know, when we launched our current strategy again a little more than three years ago, um, uh, we, you know, we had an explicit focus on uh, Black, Latino, and low-income students um, with a focus on middle and high school. So that's sort of where we started as our as our focus uh, for the K-12 strategy, and and also in the context of post-secondary success. So like our our focus has been around like what is you know you know, what are the levers for increasing the number of black, Latino, and low-income students that are earning post-secondary degrees? And that's really what led us to SEL, um, because, you know, you know, given who we are, we've been, we've been, been so focused on academics, mm -hmm. you know, our entire history, um, as we were in the strategy development process, it just became clear that SEL uh, was really a promising area to look at uh, as it relates to academic progress, particularly around post-secondary success. Uh, for the kids we care most about, because these are students that are facing structural barriers, systemic racism, negative social psychological experiences. And so that's why I was kind of touching on earlier that we really, when we looked across the field of SEL, which is broad and means a lot of different things to a lot of different people, we really anchored on, we're going to focus on identity de development, we're going to focus on learning mindsets, growth mindsets, sense of purpose, sense of belonging. And in the context of equity, it's just really hard important to remember that, you know, you don't, you, you don't develop uh, a sense of belonging, you foster it. And so that means it's really about the adults, it's about the, about the learning environment. So it really meant that um, we're obviously, you know, thinking about, you know, what we can do to foster those, the, those experiences that, for students, but it really means the unit of action is more the adults and the, and the learning environments. And to Susan's point earlier, the role of relationships uh, and, and, and creating that environment. Um, and so it's interesting that when we started it three years ago, it was very exploratory. And since then, it has really taken off like wildfire, to be honest with you. It's, we're seeing uh, the level of investment, uh, the level of demand and interest across the entire K-12 team in terms of things like middle math, post-secondary pathways, networks for school improvement. Um, uh, the demand is just, it's, it's showing up everywhere in our work. Cool. Thank you. So Karen, you know, having, you know, you run the largest organization that really focuses on SEL, you have collaborative district work, you have collaborative states work where you're really trying to help people do this work well. I'm curious, like what are the caveats that you want to, for, for schools, for large tech companies that are trying to build products that are infusing SEL into them? What are your, like, what are some caveats that you, that come to mind for you? Well, you know, what I would say is probably our biggest concern is the misunderstanding and the over-interpretation of what, what SEL is, okay. right? So when people look at SEL as just a piece of a comprehensive systemic way of doing school, what sometimes you end up with is a version of what they think is SEL that can in fact be, be potentially harmful, particularly to marginalized populations. So for example, sometimes we hear people saying they're doing SEL when really what they're doing is behavior management. Mm. And that is when it is implemented and thought of that way in error, it minimizes the focus on relationships and climate and those things that we know are going to help kids not only develop more, um, more of themselves as individuals, but also in school. Mm -hmm. 
So, you know, I think we have to be really careful about the definition itself and to not fragment social and emotional learning to become something that it isn't intended to be. And I would say that from the other thing from a, what is the caveat um, about the work, I think it's really important that we understand that social and emotional learning is not the silver bullet for everything. And it is a lever for equity and crucially mm -hmm. important, but it can't replace all of the focus on equity in a district. So sometimes we see people trying to conflate um, social and emotional learning and equity, which we think there is a very important relationship between the two, but not to the exclusion of a focus on equity. So a couple of things. One is you're reminding me of, for example, I've heard, you know, even with our own work, people say, well, I'm just going to focus on the teaching the kids in my schools how to control themselves, right? That, that sit still and like be self-controlled. And I said, well, that's not in any of our manuals. <laughs> that's not how the interpretation of this is like it's about controlling kids who have tension problems or who have, you know, difficult backgrounds. So I hear that, but I also hear in your work or your thinking is that there's like these, the processes, but then there's like real like structural things that have to like be taken care of at a school level or a district level or a state level for, you know, for real equity to happen. It's not just about the teaching of something, it's also structural. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, LaShawn, maybe you can, can share what, you know, you, this is your focus um, in terms of equity. Um, what can, what are you afraid of? What, what are you concerned about in terms of the, of the work? Yeah, I mean, I think that we, I double clicked on several of the things that Karen said. I mean, I, and I'm, I'm reminded of, I'm a quote that historian and scholar Asa Hilliard used to say all the time, which is there are no pedagogical solutions. To, there are no pedagogical uh, solutions to political problems. Um, to, to, just to suggest that um, kind of exactly in what, in what Karen was talking about, we're trying, we are using, oftentimes we see districts and schools in particular, use um, social emotional learning as a strategy um, to do a thing <laughs> um, that is supposed to actually um, potentially resolve some larger um, equity or racialized set of outcomes. Um, and so naming what it actually is, your set of strategies are supposed to produce is really an, an important part. But I think there are several concerns. One is kind of the overdialing, which we see often um, on individual competencies um, and behaviors, right? And, and, this, and compliance um, and under acknowledging the context and set of experiences young people are having in their learning environments, right? Coupled with a bias um, already that the only kind of trauma um, and disrespect and disregard that young people are experiencing are in their neighborhoods and in their homes as opposed to in their school buildings themselves and in their relationships with other adults in their learning environment um, is, a, is a dangerous proposition, um, we believe. And, and so one of the ways we think it's, it's important to mitigate that is to understand and actually be um, be focused on some structures, looking at, looking at the ways in which structures create healthy, positive relationships, affirming identity development, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that one of the ways we know that is to actually center young people's experience, not just their academic outcomes. And so how do we know how young people are experiencing us in the building we're in? I'll just, I'll just double click on this because one of the ways that we do that in our networks is actually to bring young people forward to be on design teams co-creating change. Mm -hmm. And we had a young, a young woman who was um, on a panel in one of our district network meetings earlier this year. And we asked, what do you wish your teacher, she was a recent graduate um, from high school. We asked her, what did she wish her teachers needed to know? And she said, I wish all my teachers knew that I never had anyone to go to to share the guilt and shame I felt for being different than everybody else in my school. And she went on to tell a story about having spent her ninth and 10th grade years eating lunch in a bathroom stall because it smelled, this is a Southeast, Southeast Asian student, because it smelled different, because people couldn't pronounce what it was, because people made fun of what it was, right? And so here she was in an environment, making the grades, by the way, Right, which is part of part of what we have to do is kind of expand our definition and expand what we're actually measuring as as success um, with young people. Um, 
she was making good grades, but she said it wasn't until she had an Asian American history class that she felt like she could belong in that community, right? That it wasn't until she saw the inclusion of her history, um, of contributions that people who look like her, who came from places that were like the ones that she came from, that she felt like she, she belonged in that place um, and had a voice and could contribute more powerfully. And that that changed the trajectory of her entire high school experience. One mm -hmm. class, with one teacher who said, we see you, you belong here. Here's your history, you know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. I just, we cannot underscore um, the ways in which our structures, our curriculum, our content actually move to the exclusion of young people's identity development um, and emotional development and sense mm -hmm. of belonging um, and the ways that that actually contributes to whether or not they want to behave well in school. Right. Thank you. You know, it's interesting because Related, but it's a little separate, is somebody recently told me that um, there was a child being horrifically bullied in school, and he was thrilled that he didn't have to be in school. Like, actually, remote learning was a blessing for him because, you know, he didn't have to deal, you know, with it. And it just makes you realize how little people know about children's experiences in school, you know, and, and how we don't bring in people's authentic selves into the learning environment. We just oftentimes teach at as opposed to right. with. Right. So Susan, um, my hunch is uh, over the nine years in your district, like something's, I mean, I know that you, you're perfect, but um, something's had to go wrong. So could you share, like, what do you, like, what do you, what keeps you up at night around this work, you know, with, you know, SEL and equity and what might, you know, what might you share with other superintendents, you know, in terms of mistakes made, that you don't want to be repeated. I'm not sure that you could hear my husband laughing in the background. It's a perfect <laughs> comment. He begs to differ, but um, so yeah. I mean, there's there's so many lessons learned. Um, you know, the the story that Lashawn just told is so powerful, and and I know we all have many of those um, from listening to what our young people tell us. Okay, let me start with where we are in the now, and then sort of uh, backtrack a little bit. So. so um, you know, part of leading through a crisis is to identify opportunity and opportunities for change and growth, which can be very hard, depending on how deep you are in the crisis. And, you know, we have our, our Highland Promise to know every student by name, strength, and need. And over the last nine years, we've really worked to operationalize that at scale and in fits and starts. And, you know, we had a whole child planning, to, we had several planning teams in the spring and summer, and we had a whole child planning team. And my charge to them was, when we come back, however we come back in the fall, I want every one of our 18,000 students in Highline to have an adult in their school connected to them who checks in with them weekly and gets to know who they are. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, one of the pieces of pushback I got from some folks is, well, we know all of the kids in our building. Mm -hmm. And I respectfully responded, I bet you do know most of them. And if we laid out photos of every student in your building, and we asked every staff member to put a dot next to a student that they knew well and would say they had a, a positive, respectful relationship with, there would be photos with no dots next to it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we can just, I, I, I believe so strongly, I mean, this has always been the case, but now we have an even more urgent moral imperative in this distance learning environment to do everything we can to not leave student connection to chance. Mm -hmm. um, we're leaving it to chance with the lack of broadband and I'm sure as hell not going to leave it to chance on the human end, because that is within my control. And so, as you would imagine, people are overwhelmed, and this is a new thing, but, you know, we're, we're doing it. And, and we're asking people to document it and just sort of see sort of what comes of this so that we learn. But I will say, Mark, that one of our lessons learned over the years was that we didn't really, I think, identify what the scalable systems were that we needed to really fight to put in place mm -hmm. to make sure that we're delivering on that promise for every kid. Um, and I think the only other thing that I would, would say is, um, like most people, like everyone on this screen and most people in public education, I am unapologetically pro-kid, right? We talk about being on team kid, but you can't be on team kid at the expense of the adults serving them. And I think it's really important that, and I think some days the challenge for us as leaders is how do we keep the needs of our children 
and young people at the forefront without sacrificing the well-being of the adults who are sort of supporting them. And that, I would argue, is also more of a challenge and more important ever before today. You know, you're reminding me of is, you know, as over the last five years, we have built, you know, a trauma-informed approach for the adults. And in doing that work, what we have found is that oftentimes we are unaware of how activated teachers are, right? Because they've had their own traumas they haven't managed well. And then we're asking them to do something that activates them, you know, because they haven't had the opportunity to actually cope with or learn strategies, you know, to deal with their own circumstances. And Mark, I would argue too that the story LaShawn shared, I'm sure that that teacher upon learning Learning what that young person was going through felt horrible. I would be, I would be, my soul would be crushed mm -hmm. if I knew that one of my students was living that reality and feeling so disconnected. And, and so you're right. I mean, it's the trauma we bring from our own stuff and it's what we have to deal with on a daily basis in, in realizing the realities of our children. I would just double click. Oh, I'm please, Deshaun, go ahead. I would, I would just, I, I would just connect those, right? Because part of part of the problem is that our view around education and educational reform has been really hyper, so <laughs> mechanistic, right? Instead of actually understanding that we're li that that schools and communities and classrooms are living systems with with humans in them. <laughs> um, and I think, I, in, in part of what we've, kn what we've known and kind of have always premised our work on um, is that distress in all of its forms, right, leads to unintelligent thinking and uncaring behavior. Mm -hmm. And so adults are part of this uh, ecosystem that deserve to have things designed for them, deserve to have, have deserve for them to have structures and processes wherein they also get to process and manage emotion they also get to support each other and say what they don't know they also get to see themselves reflected in the good work and thinking that like everybody needs that right so so here's the yeah. thing the gig is up if we can if we can be <laughs> successful with with everybody's understanding that learning is a social and emotional endeavor, period, right? <laughs> then we can actually mm -hmm. understand and build more humanized systems and processes. Everybody needs them. Everybody deserves them. Kind of period. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, you know, yeah. you we're on the same team, obviously. Yeah. And yeah. so, you know, one thing that you're reminding me of, I was visiting a school district, I won't say the state in the name, but it was a scripted curriculum the whole day. So at 917, you had to move to math. And at 947, like no matter what the heck you were doing, you had to move on to literacy. Right. And they're like, well, what could, and we can't do your work in SEL because it's like, you know, and it, I personally couldn't even imagine being an adult working in that environment personally, like no autonomy, no creativity, you know. And so like, how do you make, you know, there's no space for this work, right, it seems like really challenging. And so what I'm, he what I'm hearing from you is that, like we need to the levels above, like we got classrooms, we got schools, we got districts, we've got states, we've got, you know, larger departments of education that have to value this in order for it to really um, become a central part of education. Um, you know, Brad, given time, I'm wondering if you'd like to answer the question about your hopes. Um, like, what do you hope for in terms of what foundations, what nonprofits, what tech companies, what school systems, you know, can do in this space? Well, yeah, I think it's a great question. And I mean, given the challenges we've all been experiencing and our students have been experiencing that, you know, that um, we sort of take stock at this moment in time and think about you know what changes we want to see in schools going forward, based on what we're experiencing in this moment. Um, you know, I think that um, you know one thing that occurred to me is that you know obviously so many of our students, particularly those furthest from opportunity, have experienced such tremendous trauma throughout you know the twin pandemics. At the same time, we also have examples of of, of young people really stepping up and demonstrating their own agency and leadership. Uh, and we haven't talked about that as much. And so I think of examples of, you have examples of high school students leading Black Lives Matter, uh, you know, protests. You have high school students in Kentucky that worked with researchers to develop their own
survey to sort of lift up the voices of students. Um, um, we have one of my grantees actually is going to be developing an app in order to kind of connect with their students and uh, the, the, the person who, the, the group that is going to be developing the app is an alumni, is an alum of, the, of this organization, is a, a student at Stanford. And so um, I just think, it, uh, again, we should look at this moment and recognize the, the assets and the strengths and the aspirations that students have and really listen to them and think about what is it that, you know, what is it that they want out of education and what are their goals and sort of like going forward, you know, you know, you know how can we change our systems in order to sort of better meet their needs? You know, you're also reminding me of a study we did a couple of years ago. We had 45,000 high schoolers tell us about how they felt in school. And of course, unfortunately, 75% of the words were unpleasant, tired, bored, and stressed. But when we asked them, you know, what would help them feel more pleasant emotions, the number one factor was, can learning just be more relevant and meaningful to my life? <laughs> and that was just, you know, that's, that's what they want. They want a voice. Yeah, and I think it's like an engagement and motivation in, in middle and middle and high school in particular. Uh, you know, we had big challenges with that before this all started. And as we think about how to engage students virtually, hopefully we can we can learn some lessons from that and think about again what we might do differently uh, in the way you're talking about. So I'll open up to Karen, to Lashawn, to Susan. Where would like to go first? Um, you know, you can wave the magic wand and create the future um, that we all want. What are, your, what are your thoughts? What do you hope for? What do you want to see happen differently? Who would like to go first? Go. Karen, you want to go first? Go ahead. So, you know, for me, education, the field of education should have at its core child development as the basic science. And if we were to take a more holistic view, a more child development oriented view of education, our policies and our schools would then reflect a more holistic view that equally prioritizes the emotional, the social, the cognitive development of kids. And when we do that, they won't only do better in school, but these issues, not only of equity, but specific of race and racism, have a chance of being addressed. Mm -hmm. And I, I look forward to those days. Thanks, Karen. LaShawn, would you like to go? Um, sure. I'm, I, you know, I'm thinking about um, James Baldwin wrote a talk to teachers in 1963. Mm -hmm. uh, in 1963, he started that talk by saying we're living in revolutionary times. Um, and to any citizen of this country who figures him or herself responsible, um, and particularly those who deal with the heart and hearts and minds of children need to be prepared to go broke. And I feel like we're in a moment where I'm, I, I shouldn't be astounded, but I feel astounded that we are still trying to actually argue the proof of science about like what young people need to grow, learn, and thrive. Um, and part of what I think I'm hopeful of is with every, with all of the inequity and all the racial reckoning and all of the things that are unfolding, um, we're kind of beyond the moment of plausible deniability about whether or not race and racism or, or white supremacy has, has, has um, kind of permeated um, our most public um, structures that are worth fighting for. And I think the go for broke um, kind of state needs to be um, in, in just infused. Um, we have to understand that we are not doing favors to black, brown, and poor children by actually ensuring that they are in learning environments where they experience um, success and belonging and care um, and affirmed affirmative identity. Um, we are not doing that for them. We are doing this for all of us. Mm -hmm. And, and until we actually understand that our fates are indeed inextricably linked, we, it will be to our peril. And I don't mean that to be provocative. I kind of mean that literally, like, look at where we are right now. Oh, like we actually need each other. And if we do not understand that 
changing and expanding the goals of this system to include something other than, than academic gain um, and, um, and financial security. If we, if we do not expand the goals of this system to be about wellness, we are going to be in trouble as a nation. Thank you for that. I think one thing that you know that you sparked in my brain, you know, in the way you frame things is, is equity is about, um, it's not about the people who have greater power kind of letting the other people have more power, <laughs> which is a mindset I think that a lot of people have. It's like, we're, you know, that's, it's, does that resonate with you in terms of like that shift in mindset? Yeah, I, th I think so. I mean, I think part of what you're describing is potentially a tactic, right? Not an outcome of, a, a, well, it might be a tactic, but yes, I understand what you mean, right? Equity is about all of us. Yeah. Like, it, you know, Angela Blackwell talks about it as the superior growth model. Like, it's good for everybody when it's actually working for all, for, for the least of us, right? And, and so, um, but yeah, I don't think we, there's not enough demonstration of proof of that. And so, right. yeah, yes. And, you know, power doesn't concede anything without demand. We know that, which is, which is why we can't instructional strategy our way <laughs> to actually having a more equitable and just set of institutions or nation, right? Um, and so there is kind of, there, we're in a wrestle right now. I'd argue we're in, the rest, we're in a wrestle um, and a fight for the soul and identity of this nation. Who are we, who are we gonna be? in this moment is what's at stake. It's so much bigger than any, any reform effort, right? Um, and yet our efforts actually have to be aligned, I think, to a more, a more broad um, and inclusive vision of the world that we actually want to live in. Thank you. I, wanna, I actually want to just end there, but we can't. So <laughs> I'd like that as a, as a final word. Um, I want to make sure that people are asking questions. We, I typed it into the chat room, but I haven't seen any questions yet. So. We have seven minutes left, so if you have ideas that you want our panel to, um, to flesh out or embellish, please uh, type them in. And I'm gonna turn it over to Susan in terms of your hopes. Yeah, so I love, I love everything that LaShawn said. I especially love the go for broke um, statement. I would argue that those of us who work within public education, many of us have been going for broke for a long time. And we've been doing it against a society that is not with us on this. In fact, they're, they're actually throwing more for us to do in order to go for broke. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that all, everyone here knew for a long time, but I think the general public maybe wasn't as aware, is just the extent to which we lay the responsibility for societal equity at the schoolhouse door. That is what we do in this nation. We say, you know what, housing disparities, healthcare disparities, food insecurity, unemployment, all of that. You know what, when you walk into school, none of that can matter. The school's gonna fix it all. They're gonna make sure that you're gonna get an education that can transcend all of those roots that permeate too many of our communities. And I think what we're realizing right now is that that is too tall of an ask for any system, but especially an entrenched bureaucracy like K-12 public education. Mm -hmm. I mean, let's get real, people. This is not exactly the most nimble, innovative, you know, and I say this with love, <laughs> I've put my right. life to this, to this crowd. Like, don't, you know, I'm putting myself in this. What, I, what I'd love for us to see is that we are put, truly putting our children not just at the center of, of our public education system, but at the center of our nation. And that finally, once and for all, we as a society see the power that public education can have on keeping our children at the center of who we are. When LaShawn says, who are we? What's the soul? Well, if who we are, if, if the best of who we are isn't caring for our children, then I, I don't I don't know what else there is that 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 weighs up to that. So I hope that we can put the, the shared responsibility and focus on our children, not just our school systems, because our school systems can't do it alone. It's bigger. It's all of us. Thank you, Susan. So I think that you know we have been so riveting that people are, you know, frozen in their seats. 
Um, and so we've got about four minutes Saturn, left. nobody's listening. <laughs> exactly. It's the story of my life. I talk to myself all day long. Um, I'm just curious, you know, what else is on your mind? Do you have questions for each other? We've been talking, you know, this way. Maybe we can go a little bit this way. Mm-hmm. What's on your, what are you, what are you thinking? I think we actually have a real opportunity, right? I mean, look at it's, you know, when you listen to Susan and LaShawn and Brad, I mean, everybody's coming at the work from a different seat around the table, but I think we're all looking at and seeing the same things. And that is, you know, things need to change and we can't simply try to replicate what was happening the way it was happening when school was in person 100% and now try to do the same thing online. And when you listen to the parents and the kids and the teachers and, and everyone involved in the system, one thing is clear. Without social and emotional learning deeply embedded into the way we define success in kids and the way our schools are structured, when that didn't happen in school, now you try to do school the way online education is working without it, it is even magnified more. And I think we have a real opportunity to rethink what it means to be educated in this country and what we value. And, and I think that people at, at this conference and, and certainly on this panel are all in a position to help advance this movement. Um, and, and I see it as a real opportunity. Do you think we could use some good role models in our country? <laughs> <laughs> the soft lob, Mark. <laughs> Mark, what's on your mind? <laughs> exactly. I don't know. 7 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, but uh, the, you know, I mean, I'm curious. And our last question is like barriers. Like, what are barriers? Like, why is it, you know, what's the, what, are the, what do we need to get out of our way in order for this to be, for our dream to be a reality? One barrier from each of you or one thought as we wrap up our time together. Um, I'd say uh, the barrier I was thinking about is um, that the mind, the kind of mindset of what school is, kind of it's it's hard. Our our notion and understanding about what school is is so deeply entrenched and like hardwired into our into our DNA that it's difficult to actually think about using radical imagination to to redesign as as Karen was talking about and kind of reimagine something something different so much so that the overlay of like the in-person structure in the virtual environment was almost on that right people actually have, have spent time thinking about what a discipline policy actually needs to look like in this environment so that Welcome back, everybody. Um, thank you.